ABC News Live. Tonight, a bombshell day in court as the opening arguments in the first criminal trial of a former president gets underway. Donald Trump's hush money trial kicks off in a major way. What we heard from Trump's legal team and prosecutors and the testimony from former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker. And who else is expected to testify in a case that could rock the political world? Plus, why are you doing this to me? Dueling demonstrations, heavy police presence, and classes that are now remote. We're on the grounds of Columbia University where tensions around the Israel-Hamas conflict and its impact on the people of Gaza are reaching a tipping point. And then we kept getting better at it and better at it and better at it. And the world keeps getting in worse and worse and worse shape. And then recycling becomes a thing. And all of a sudden, hey, this idiot that's building buildings out of garbage, maybe, maybe he's not such an idiot after all. On this Earth Day, we explore how the power to help save the future lies within all of us. Their homes not connected to water or electricity and utilize recycled materials for their structures. They're called Earth Ships. And tonight, Ginger Z pays a visit to New Mexico, where more than 100 of them serve as an example of what the future could look like. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including the foreign aid package making its way through Congress that could be signed by the president any day now, but could it ban TikTok along with it? Plus, the near disaster at one of the busiest airports in the country. Authorities say air traffic control cleared four planes to cross in front of a passenger jet as it was about to take off. The pilot then aborting takeoff. We have the calls to the tower. And the queen of R&B finally gets her crown, what Mary J. Blige, Cher, and Ozzy Osbourne all have in common tonight. But we do begin with opening statements, the first testimony in Donald Trump's historic criminal trial here in New York. For the first time, a former American president is on trial for criminal charges, facing 34 counts of falsifying business records to allegedly cover up a hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels just before the 2016 election. Trump says none of it is true and has pleaded not guilty to all charges. Prosecutors outline their case today, accusing the former president of a criminal conspiracy and a cover-up to influence the election. The defense, though, pushed back, saying there is nothing wrong with trying to influence an election, saying none of what is accused was a crime. And prosecutors called their first witness David Pecker, the former publisher of the National Enquirer, calling him an alleged co-conspirator in the plot to silence Stormy Daniels and others. We have legal insight from ABC News analyst Kim Whaley and a look at the political implications from former RNC chair and ABC News contributor Reince Priebus. But first, ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky leads us off from the courthouse. Donald Trump walking into the Manhattan courtroom where today, for the first time in history, a jury heard testimony in a criminal case against a former American president. It's a very, very sad day in America, I can tell you that. With Trump slouching in his seat and sometimes closing his eyes, prosecutor Matthew Colangelo began his opening statement charging Trump orchestrated a criminal scheme to corrupt the 2016 presidential election. Jurors listening intently, some taking notes as the prosecutor laid out his case, accusing Trump of falsifying business records to disguise a $130,000 hush payment to porn star Stormy Daniels days before the election so voters wouldn't find out about her claim of an affair. At the time, Trump was under pressure. News had just broken of the Access Hollywood tape. Trump caught on camera bragging about groping women. The prosecutor today quoting Trump's own words to the jury. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. You can do anything, the prosecutor slowly reciting to the jury. Prosecutor said the tape's impact was explosive, and Trump and his campaign were deeply concerned. So when Trump learned Stormy Daniels was shopping a story of their alleged liaison, prosecutor said he was adamant it not come out, fearing it could have been devastating to the campaign. Prosecutors allege at Trump's direction, his fixer Michael Cohen paid Daniels off and agreed to cook the books, so when Trump reimbursed him, it appeared as routine legal bills. The prosecutor called it a conspiracy to influence the 2016 election to help Donald Trump get elected. Election fraud, pure and simple. In his opening statement, defense attorney Todd Blanch insisting President Trump is innocent. President Trump did not commit any crimes. I have a spoiler alert, he told the jury. There is nothing wrong with trying to influence an election. It's called democracy. There is nothing illegal about entering into a non-disclosure agreement, he continued, period. He said Trump was unaware of any effort to camouflage the payment to Daniels as a business expense, and he told the jury Michael Cohen, a key prosecution witness, has an obsession with getting Trump. He cannot be trusted. 
But prosecutors insist the alleged criminal conspiracy to protect Trump involved others, including their first witness, David Pecker, the former National Enquirer publisher who once called Trump a personal friend. As Pecker took the stand, Trump leaned forward, arms crossed, an angry look on his face. Pecker has acknowledged buying negative stories about the candidate only to bury them, a practice known as catch and kill. On the stand, Pecker was blunt. We use checkbook journalism. We paid for stories. He's testifying under a subpoena, having cut a deal with prosecutors to avoid charges himself. He was only on the stand a few minutes today, but he'll be back tomorrow. Leaving court, Trump, who denies the affair with Daniels, tried to downplay the case against him. It's a case as to bookkeeping, which is a very minor thing in terms of the law. Aaron Katursky joins us now from outside of the courthouse. Aaron, what's up for tomorrow? So David Pecker will be back on the witness stand tomorrow, Lindsay. But before that, the judge is going to hear arguments over whether Trump violated his gag order. Prosecutors say it's happened repeatedly when Trump has posted disparaging things about witnesses, including Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels. Prosecutors want Trump to pay a fine, $1,000 per each offending post. But they also want the judge to hold Trump in contempt. And that could lead to even more severe consequences. Lindsay? All right, just a snowball effect potentially. Aaron Katursky, we know we've seen a lot of you as this trial continues. Thank you. For more on today's proceedings in the courtroom and what to watch for as the trial gets underway, we're joined now by Kim Whaley. She's an ABC News legal analyst and author of the forthcoming book, Pardon Power. Kim, thank you so much for joining us. What stood out to you in the opening statements from the prosecution and defense today? Well, it's the prosecution laid out that it's this is not just about whether the jury's going to believe Michael Cohen, but they said they have corroborating evidence that's going to back up his story, presumably that he talked to Donald Trump and Donald Trump knew and had the intention to do this hush money payment to basically benefit the election. On the defense side, um, the seems like the argument wasn't so much, listen, this didn't happen, or even that he, Donald Trump wasn't aware of it. I think they will argue argue that and that, you know, of course, Michael Cohen's not to be trusted, all of that. But they're essentially encouraging the jury to nullify the charges and to have a sort of a shrug about this, kind of uh, making the argument that even if everything the prosecution says is true, it doesn't matter because this is just the hurly burly rough and tumble of a presidential election to do these kinds of things. And the prosecution in this case must prove that Trump not only falsified business records, but that he did so in order to commit some other crime. Do you think that that's a high bar here? You know, I do in part um, because the falsification of business records in New York tends to be tacked on to other kinds of crimes, so that's novel. But also the theory that um, these hush money payments constituted violations of the federal campaign and election laws, I think there's some debate on that. And, the, and again, the prosecution's going to need, in order to raise this from a misdemeanor to a felony, that's where we are, to have to demonstrate the intent was to, to impact the election. The the timeline itself, though, Lindsay, you know, the, the, after the Access Hollywood tape, the allegations that maybe even the RNC was going to drop him as a candidate, uh, there's a strong sort of argument that this was for that purpose, which I believe is why the defense came up and said, well, even if this happens, listen, you know, jury, this just it doesn't rise to the level of a crime that could deprive this man of his liberty uh, and put him in prison, which essentially are the implications here, even though it seems like a lesser type of case than the other three that are pending against him in other courtrooms across the country. And less than a minute to go here, but the prosecution's first witness is former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker. He'll be on the stand tomorrow again. Uh, what will you be watching for from him? Well, it all boils down, really, that the line between civil liability and criminal liability is this intent, this mens rea. So will, will David Pecker testify? Reportedly, there was a high-level meeting with him and Michael Cohen. Is he going to give testimony about what he discussed with Donald Trump, not just with respect to Stormy Daniels, but with respect to Karen McDougal, some others around, listen, we have to put a lid on this because of the election. It's that because and whether David Pecker can tie Donald Trump Trump's knowledge and intent to the story that matters. ABC News legal analyst Kim Whaley, we thank you so much as always.
Joining us now for more, former RNC chair, White House chief of staff to President Trump and an ABC News contributor, Reince Priebus. Uh, Reince, thanks so much for joining us. Of course, it's only been the first day of Trump's trial, half day really, but anything that you can glean based on that amount of time about how this will impact him politically? Well, I mean, look, it depends on whether or not you're of the belief that 24-7 of Donald Trump helps Donald Trump or hurts Donald Trump. I happen to believe that if you look at the polling today, where it has been 24-7 Donald Trump and the media has been all over these trials, it's been a nonstop issue. If you look at every one of these battleground states, he's not losing in a single state. So, you know, look, I, I think that um, so far that has, you know, these things have not hurt the president at all. And someone could make the argument that it's actually been helpful. And we can be in this trial for maybe six weeks with a former president in court every day with a crush of cameras following his every move. Do you expect him to, to flip this criminal trial to his benefit? Well, you know, so far, I think the president's slowly but surely making himself out to, to be a victim. I mean, you saw that with not being able to go to this Baron Trump graduation. You saw the, the uh, statements that he's made recently and even today that he can't go to the Supreme Court. He was complaining that the, the, the temperature in the courtroom was, was very cold. So I think... You know, I mean, if it goes on and on and on, you might see him looking more like a victim and it may even help him further. But, you know, the one thing that a lot of folks aren't talking about, Lindsay, is that it, what if he gets acquitted? Uh, you know, I don't see a lot of people out there talking about the possibility of an acquittal. It only takes one juror um, and you never know where this thing's going to go. Uh, the prosecution has to prove this novel theory of the attorney general. I think even people who don't like Donald Trump would agree that it's a it's a novel theory. It's something that we haven't seen before. If he gets acquitted, there's no doubt it's going to supercharge him uh, in this campaign. And it could very well uh, serve as rocket fuel to uh, the election. So I think that's something that everyone needs to think about. And today's prosecution's opening statement referenced the RNC when you were chairman, reminding the jury about the release of that now infamous Access Hollywood tape. Uh, what then candidate Donald Trump said in the controversy around that shortly before the 2016 election. Uh, the prosecution says that the RNC, while you were chair, was so concerned about it that they entertained replacing Trump ahead of the election. Is that true? Well, there were people that talked about it, but since I was general counsel of the RNC before I was RNC chair, I knew the rules inside and out, and there was no process to replace President Trump at that time, and so the process didn't exist. There were senators and people that talked about it, but it didn't rise to any level and nothing was ever, nothing ever came of it at all because it wasn't even possible in the rules. Wasn't possible, but anything you ever talked about in any way, one way or another, with Trump at the time? No, because I knew the rules. So <laughs> I, I knew that, the, you know, the only way you could replace someone on the ballot is if they died. Or I don't even know if they even volunteered, whether that was a, a sufficient enough reason. So there wasn't any way to do it. I guess my question is, though, considering that there were those who are bringing it up, is it something you would have said, hey, you know, this isn't a possibility, but there are people, just so you know, who are trying to get you out? Um, well, I think people were making a lot of public statements that you can find online uh, after the Access Hollywood tape came out. But we, everyone has to understand something. In mid-October, you know, a third of the country already voted. The absentee ballot voting. I mean, the ballots are printed. The ballots are at the municipal clerk's office. And, and, and not to mention there was no replacement process. So all of that was, I think, for some people, wishful thinking. Do you think the former president could have handled the release of the video in a better way? Uh, I think he handled it pretty well. I mean, he... He, he did a video the night of the Access Hollywood. He apologized, and then he took it on head-on 
at that second debate uh, pretty quickly in the debate. So, look, I mean, he won the election in spite of a lot of these challenges. And so, obviously, he read the room uh, better than most, I think, maybe better than anybody. Reince Priebus, appreciate your insight. Thank you so much for making the time. You bet. Thank you. Tensions continue to be at high at Columbia University, causing classes to go remote today. This is all due to the continuing debate surrounding Israel and Palestinians, leading to more arrests today as protests spread to additional campuses. ABC Stephanie Ramos was at Columbia University tonight with the details. Tonight, college campuses scrambling to handle a growing pro-Palestinian protest movement. Columbia University stepping up campus security and moving classes online. The school's president saying we need a reset to de-escalate the rancor. But today, fresh arrests and tensions boiling over on the first night of Passover. This Israeli assistant professor confronting university officials over being denied access to the main lawn as school officials try to separate protesters. I am a professor here. I have every right to be everywhere on campus. You cannot let people that support Hamas on campus and me, a professor, not go on campus. Let me in now. It comes after a campus rabbi urged students to stay home, saying the school and the NYPD cannot guarantee Jewish students a safety. New York Mayor Eric Adams saying he is horrified and disgusted with anti-Semitism spewed at and around Columbia's campus. Pointing to videos circulating online, such as this one, showing a woman in front of pro-Israel protesters with a sign reading al Qazam's next targets, a reference to Hamas's military wing. Made me sick hearing the things they were saying and doing. Um, so over this holiday, I kind of just want to try to avoid it as best as I can for my own safety. Many pro-Palestinian protesters insist their movement is peaceful. Violence has no place on, on this movement, uh, and we regret some of, some of the uh, incidents that has happened uh, that were actually unassociated with, with this movement. The protests, calling for colleges to divest from companies with ties to Israel, now spreading to other campuses. Today, at least 45 people arrested at Yale University. At NYU, a standoff with police after protesters were told to vacate a campus plaza. Many student protests in solidarity with those Columbia protesters. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, when will students be able to return to campus at Columbia? Well, many students here are still waiting to find out. They are not sure when they can return to in-person classes. We do know that the New York governor, Kathy Hochul, did visit the campus today, calling for people to find humanity and have those difficult conversations so they can understand different points of view. Lindsay. Conversation so important. Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. Now to the near disaster at JFK Airport after authorities say air traffic control cleared four planes to cross in front of a passenger jet as it was about to take off. Here's ABC's Ike Jachi. Tonight, the FAA is investigating a near disaster at one of the nation's busiest airports. An April 17th Zurich-bound Swiss air flight cleared for takeoff at JFK, beginning to speed down the runway, forced to abort after noticing air traffic control also cleared four other planes to cross that same runway, putting them on a collision course. Listen to air traffic control clearing Swiss air flight 17. Swiss 117, you four left, there, stay off. Then, moments later, as the plane is headed down the runway, the pilot suddenly sees the other planes taxiing and aborts the takeoff. Tonight, the Swiss airline praising their quick-thinking team, saying in a statement due to the high level of situational awareness, a potentially dangerous situation was quickly de-escalated. Moving four aircraft across an active runway uh, and one controller not talking to another indicates a special level of stress. The incident came just a day before another near catastrophic close call. Panic in the tower at Washington's Reagan National Airport as two packed planes came within 400 feet of each other. A JetBlue flight cleared for takeoff, forced to slam on its brakes after air traffic control noticed they cleared a southwest plane to taxi across the same runway. A number of these close calls lately. Ike Jachi joins us now. Ike, what does the FAA plan to do when it comes to air traffic controllers? Well, Lindsay, while the FAA investigates this latest incident, they're also addressing fatigue concerns for all air traffic controllers, increasing the amount of rest time between shifts. Lindsay?
All right, Ike Ajachi for us. Thanks so much, Ike. For the first time in decades, the Supreme Court heard a major case involving homelessness. The justices heard arguments for more than two and a half hours and appear to favor cities having the ability to find unhoused people for sleeping outside. Critics say this amounts to cruel and unusual punishment. It comes as homeless numbers are skyrocketing nationwide. Next tonight, Ukrainian President Zelensky is expressing relief and gratitude after the House approved a massive aid package with bipartisan support. The Senate is expected to take it up tomorrow. House Speaker Mike Johnson is being widely praise for getting the package over the finish line, but some members of his own party are still insisting he must resign. ABC's Selena Wang is on Capitol Hill tonight. Tonight, with that $95 billion aid package finally making its way through Congress, a new lifeline for Ukraine in its war against Russia. President Zelensky saying in his evening address, I am grateful to Mr. President, his team, everyone in the United States Congress, personally to Speaker Johnson and all who support the active defense of freedom. Zelensky speaking to President Biden by phone today, Biden vowing to sign the bill into law as soon as it reaches his desk. But tonight, Russia's foreign minister warning the Westerners are teetering dangerously on the brink of a direct military clash between nuclear powers. The bill is passed. It comes just days after Speaker Mike Johnson put his job on the line to pass that aid package in the House. Nearly $61 billion for Ukraine, $26 billion for Israel, and $8 billion for Taiwan. Plus, legislation that would ban TikTok if its Chinese parent company doesn't sell the app. You do the right thing and you let the chips fall where they may. It's a dramatic 180 for Johnson, a devout Christian who was staunchly against aid to Ukraine. But after classified briefings and lots of praying, Johnson making a complete turnaround, arguing that Ukraine is critical to U.S. national security. But hardline Republicans fuming, with at least three still threatening to oust him. He's uh, disappointed us. He can't be speaker. So I'm drawing a line in the sand here. Selena joins us now. Uh, Selena, what's next for the aid package? And secondly, can you tell us a little more about that possible TikTok ban? Yeah, Lindsay, so this $95 billion aid package, it is expected to speed through the Senate. And there is bipartisan support, Lindsay, for that potential TikTok ban in there. But this could be a very long road ahead. First of all, it's very hard to find a buyer that can afford TikTok. So experts tell me it is likely that it could go public instead. In addition to that, TikTok, they would fight any potential ban in the courts, and the Chinese government could block a possible sale. Lindsay? Selena Wang from Capitol Hill for us. Thanks so much, Selena. Now to the manhunt underway for a gunman who opened fire at Delaware State University, killing an 18-year-old woman. Classes were canceled today as police searched for the killer. The victim was a student at a nearby college on campus to visit a friend. Investigators say they believe she was an innocent victim caught in the crossfire when shots rang out following a dispute. Police have yet to identify a suspect. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. The state is pursuing emergency legislation that would allow Arizona doctors to practice reproductive care inside California. But next, a lifelong dream turned into reality. Meet the man behind Earth Shifts vessels built into the earth he's hoping to prove it's possible to live with our land and not against it and she said well i couldn't even tell i was in an earth ship i thought i was in a regular home but everything feels the same and i'm like i've been busting my ass for 50 years and you say you can't even tell it's an earth ship but then i thought about it that's what i want whenever news breaks we are here in Israel, a nation at war, after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news.
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From the team that brought you the DuPont Award-winning report, a groundbreaking new investigation spanning 9,000 miles, trashed the secret life of plastic exports, streaming Tuesday night on ABC News Live. With so much at stake in our world right now, more Americans turn here to David than anywhere else. And now, America's most trusted, most watched newscast, ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir, is available to you on YouTube. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! <laughs> For our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. So these bags are identical, but one is real and one is fake. This feels like real. So I got a bunch of super fakes. Some of these are chef's kiss. A million dollar life. This is a counterfeit. Really? The Louis Vuitton, the Prada, the Gucci, we get everything. To make us a, a super fake is easier now than ever before. Anybody can be fooled. Anybody. Super fakes, now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back, everyone. This week, we are bringing you a special week-long series for Earth Week called The Power of Us, featuring stories of everyday people finding innovative solutions for climate change, living with the land. It's become a special point of interest as we try to reverse, or at very least slow, the damage being done to our Earth. Enter Earth ships, living vessels built into the Earth, not connected to any water or electricity, and made with gravel, old tires, concrete, and essentially trash. There are about 100 Earth ships in New Mexico, and that's where we find our Ginger Z, who lived in one, to see how it all works. I imagine everybody on the planet can be comfortable without fossil fuel. This is it. It's not a pipe dream. This is it. This water was rain. That's aloe vera. This is kale. Here are tomatoes right here. I know that these tomatoes don't have pesticides. I'm living with my food. I'm 79, I have stage four cancer, and this lifestyle is keeping me alive. Yeah. Everybody can grow food in their house. Everybody can have electricity from the sun and wind. Everybody can learn how to treat their sewage. These buildings do that. So I just live, eat, sleep, and breathe Earthships because they take care of me. OK, this is wild. Wow. <laughs> the pictures don't even do it justice. Good morning. Hi. How are you? Let's start when you move out here in 1969. Tell me about the process. I designed a building brick out of beer cans. Uh, I was in my 20s, and I told this engineer friend in a bar about the idea. I'm going to build a house out of beer cans, because they're all over the place, and we want to get rid of them. And we don't want to get rid of trees. Yeah. It seemed logical. We use the garbage in this community, cans, tires, cardboard. We use every bottle that anybody can find. We use a huge portion of the garbage. How does it feel to be the father of Earth ships? Well, it's like any other father situation. It had its ups and downs. <laughs> <laughs> but overall, it's starting to take a life of its own. 
The simple definition of an airship is that it's a dwelling vessel that encounters the phenomena of the planet to provide sustenance for the people that live in it. And there are six pillars. People need comfortable shelter wherever they are that doesn't require fossil fuel. They need water. They need electricity. We're not going backwards. They need to do something with human waste. They need to do something with garbage. And they need food. It's about the autonomy of the vessel. So you got a crew out here already. Wait, we're going to go through here? Are there rattlesnakes? Uh, not too many. <laughs> <laughs> I started using tires as an effort to recycle. Mm -hmm. And I have never been any place on this planet that doesn't have tires. Mm -hmm. So why not build with tires? My first building, the guys that were working with me thought, this guy is crazy. Then we kept getting better at it and better at it and better at it. And the world keeps getting in worse and worse and worse shape. And then recycling becomes a thing. And all of a sudden, hey, this idiot that's building buildings out of garbage, maybe, maybe he's not such an idiot after all. I mean, they're actually putting this in by hand, like pounding dirt into tires. The tire wall is so wide that it doesn't need a foundation. So you have a five or six foot thick wall. So the heat is not going to go out here. And how many tires in a refuge? Thousands, say. Eh? This is how you stay young, huh? Yeah, you either die or stay young. <laughs> <laughs> tires are known for leaching toxins. Oh, yeah. Why is this OK to live in? After a tire has got 10,000 miles on it, it doesn't off-gas anymore. There is more off-gassing in a conventional home than there is in a tire home. That's a pounded tire. It's and beautiful. That's, that's all there is to it. Hello. Hello. Welcome to the Earthships. Thank you. Oh, it feels so nice and toasty oh, in here. Oh, yeah. I'm going to check you into the Phoenix where you're going to be staying this evening. So welcome to the Phoenix. <laughs> We're entering wow. the jungle in the middle of the desert at 7,000 feet. The Phoenix has 5,000 square feet, and 2,000 of it Big. is growing space. So this is the master bedroom. This is quite the bathroom. <laughs> this is the bathroom. You've got earth, water, and fire in your living room. We have all the modern amenities that everybody else has, you yeah. know? Living in an airship tonight. We're going to go for the night without supplemental heat. I'm up. I slept pretty well. I was definitely warm. And I guess that's what counts, because it is not warm outside. I like set the timer and get the water warmed up. I have a little leftover coffee and grounds, and I'm gonna go put that in the compost. It is so quiet. You feel like you're in the earth or more a part of nature. This is the refuge style? This is the refuge style. The most economical airship. Mm-hmm. On a cold night, you walk in one of these and you go, this is amazing, this is warm, and there's no heating system here. So if you put people in a position to be able to experience it, that's huge. So this is just like a brand new construction. It's just everything is made very simple. You take a shower there, goes into this planter. And then that's used? To flush the toilet. And that is how you conserve water. And this water came from the sky. It's only trash when it looks like trash, but when it's like this, it doesn't look it. Yeah, it's alchemy is what it really is. You're turning trash into gold. I wrap everything I want to do in hamburger. Mm -hmm. For the law, for the codes, for the people even, because hamburger is what they know. Make it attractive. Make it comfortable. Make it taste good. Make, Make it, it so that when you're in an earthship, you don't even know. Some woman came to stay in one, and she said, well, I couldn't even tell I was in an earthship. I thought I was in a regular home. It, everything feels the same. And I'm like, I've been busting my ass for 50 years, <laughs> and you say you can't even tell it's an earthship? But then I thought about it. That's what I want. 
Now that we've been here a day, I can see how I could live here, but I don't know about raising a family. I don't know about raising my two boys. Thankfully, we've got Tom. I've been building this house for about 27 years. So this is home sweet home. The house started with a little hut on that side, and then we built the bigger house in the middle. Then we added this on, and then we attached the hut. So it's been nonstop. We have a bedroom here. That was my boys' bedrooms for years. The boys lived there their whole lives. Yeah, they were born here, and they're true Earthship kids. Did they ever struggle with, like, all oh, those are the Earthship kids? Their friends would come out here and just be blown away by the plants and stuff. Right. It was special. Yeah. There wasn't a sacrifice for them. This house performs like a, a normal house in so many ways, and so they weren't really lacking for anything. If we can get the minds and even hearts of people to want this and to realize they need it, there's, the, the law will follow. Over the years, permitting got in the way a lot for Earthships, and sustainable building hasn't always been at the forefront of every state's policy. So we figured we'd come here and see what they're doing to make sustainable living more likely. Fancy meeting you here. You as well. Wonderful to see you, Governor. Nice to see you, yeah. Ginger. Shall we go this yes, way? Yes, please. We just came from living in an Earth ship, so apologies if I'm a little wrinkled. And... How was that? <laughs> I haven't lived in an Earth ship. Would you try? Oh, I would try in a minute. How important is it to experiment with sustainability like that? Oh, I think all of that has incredible value. I mean, knowing that you can live completely off the grid. Right. And have sustainable building materials all recycled. We sometimes forget. There isn't anything we can't do, which is why I stay both humbled and positive. There are permit rules. There are a lot of, it, it comes down to, it costs so much to try. We made clear that we are going to incentivize where we build mm -hmm. to local bodies of government that modernize their zoning and permitting. You can't build these and be innovative fast enough to meet the needs okay. uh, of your communities. Then um, we're going to look at other strategies that put you in a position where there's uh, less option for your refusal. What would you say you'd like your legacy to be? I want to see millions of these all over the planet. Not everyone will be able to live in an Earthship tomorrow, but if there's one lesson that conventional construction should take, we should try to live with the Earth, not against it. Baby steps into the future. Our thanks to Ginger for that. A basic model, two bedroom, two bathroom Earthship goes for $400,000. They do have several that you can rent to try out. This is just a piece of our bigger special, The Power of Us. A deeper look into the impact we can make on the Earth when we work together. Watch The Power of Us Thursday at 8.30 right here on ABC News Live. Still much more to get to tonight. Inside the dangerous world of substance abuse in prison, there is a beacon of hope, though, a counseling program for inmates by inmates. Coming up, meet the man behind the 50, a new documentary that shows how the program works. And next, lawmakers take one step closer to banning TikTok. A look at the app's massive popularity and the concerns that come with it by the numbers. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies or play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. Involuntary manslaughter charges against parents of the shooter at Oxford High School who killed four students and wounded others. There's a myth that the shooter just snaps. It's just not true. There are always signs he was crying for help and being ignored. He had pictures of a target on his bedroom wall, shell casings on his nightstand. A very toxic, turbulent relationship. Those people are yikes. The life they lived was just crazy. The sexting and the really terrible things they'd video of their sexual acts. They purchased that gun for him with his money and bragged about it. They're being told by a school counselor that he thinks their son's going to kill himself. And they do nothing. 
As soon as I heard they were called to the school that day, the messages about LOL, don't get caught, those were very, very concerning to me. That's the moment that no juror is gonna think, well, haven't we all been there? Here's what it is. I got it. They do not seem shocked about him having the gun. There was no shock. Zero. Zero. School shooters aren't created, they're made, and it's made over time. You don't get to walk away from that. You just don't. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. That foreign aid bill the House passed this weekend included legislation that would ban the popular social media app TikTok if its China-based owner doesn't sell its stake within a year. We have a look at the app's booming popularity and the concerns about it by the numbers. 33% of U.S. adults use TikTok. That's according to a Pew Research Center study. That's up from about 20% just two years ago, which is a higher rate of growth than other social media platforms. The biggest users, 63% of teenagers use the platform. More than half say they use it daily, and 17% confess to being on it almost constantly. But for all the scrolling, only 52% of TikTok users, young and old, have ever posted a video on the platform. 98% of publicly accessible videos come from just a quarter of the app's users. What are people scrolling for? 43% of users turn to TikTok for their news, while media consumption has stagnated or declined on other social media sites in recent years. It's actually doubled on TikTok. As of last fall, 38% of Americans said they'd support a government ban on TikTok like the one passed in the House this weekend. President Biden has said he'll sign the legislation if it passes the Senate and reaches his desk. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. The next stars and legends set to be added to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and cleaning up our shorelines. Meet the student volunteers coming together to pick up litter and improve our water this Earth Day. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies or play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. They purchased that gun for him and bragged about it. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. All the exclusive and buzziest celebrity good stuff. Deals and steals with amazing savings and the coolest lifestyle tips from Good Morning America. I love that so much. GMA Life. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Your weekend just got a little better with GMA Life. Wherever news breaks. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From the team that brought you the DuPont Award-winning report, a groundbreaking new investigation spanning 9,000 miles, trashed the secret life of plastic exports, streaming Tuesday night on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So these bags are identical, but one is real and one is fake. This feels like real. So I got a bunch of super fakes. Some of these are chef's kiss. Mm -hmm. This is a counterfeit. Really? The Louis Vuitton, the Prada, the Gucci, we get everything. To make us a super fake is easier now than ever before. Anybody can be fooled. Anybody. Super fakes, now streaming on Hulu. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. A suspect is arrested after allegedly breaking into the home of the Los Angeles mayor. A tram crashes and injures more than a dozen people at Universal Studios. And who are the new inductees into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? These stories and much more in tonight's rundown. There was a break-in at the official residence of the mayor of Los Angeles. An alarm system was triggered Sunday morning, sending the LAPD rushing in. Police say the 29-year-old man who broke in is in custody. There was a massive police response to the early morning break-in. Mayor Bass hasn't made any public comment about it, but her staff says she's safe and well. The case has not been brought before the district attorney, and the LAPD is still investigating. Officials say 15 people were injured as a tram tipped over at Universal Studios in Los Angeles. Officials say the tram was carrying passengers and was making a turn on the park studio backlot tour when it crashed into a metal railing. The vehicle then tipped over. Several passengers fell out. 15 people were injured and taken to local hospitals for treatment. The cause of the crash is under investigation. California Governor Gavin Newsom says he's pursuing emergency legislation that would allow Arizona doctors to practice reproductive care inside California. Newsom says California has seen demand climb by 17 percent since Roe v. Wade was rolled back. California has made itself a safe haven for those seeking abortions. The emergency law he mentions would expedite approval for Arizona health care workers to perform abortions in California. Work is now beginning on a high-speed rail line that could cut travel time in half compared to driving between two big U.S. regions. Political, union, and business leaders from both Nevada and California kicked off construction of what is designed to be the first true high-speed rail. According to officials, the train will eventually move people between Southern California and Las Vegas in just over two hours. It will run along a notoriously clogged highway between L.A. and Vegas, just in time to debut before the 2028 L.A. Olympics. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame unveiled their latest class of inductees. Cher, Mary J. Blige, Dave Matthews Band, Ozzy Osbourne, Cool and the Gang, and others are set to receive music's highest honor. The induction ceremony with performances and tributes will air later this year from the Hall of Fame's hometown, Cleveland, Ohio. The Hall of Fame has been selecting legendary musicians since 1986 and requires artists or bands to release their first recording at least 25 years before they are considered for induction. A stray cat has found an unlikely new home. Officers at the Kentwood Police Department in Michigan noticed a cat coming to their back door looking for food about a year ago. 
since then, the cat has returned, and recently the officers decided to let the furry friend join their ranks as a leader of the force's so-called feline unit. Officers chipped in to get the cat vaccinated and microchipped. Along the way, police gave their new friend a clever name, Donut. Time now for the latest in our series, Streamlined, where we bring you some of the biggest films and TV series hitting screens worldwide, speaking with some of the actors and creators of them. A new documentary takes us inside a world of concrete and razor wire. The California Department of Correction and Rehabilitation was known for dangerous levels of overcrowding and substance abuse, a dangerous environment for the inmates inside. Federal courts ruled these conditions unconstitutional spurring the need for new programs to rehabilitate incarcerated people. Let's take a look. The thing I did do was try to change my life, to be a better person. Use that energy to do what you need to do for our community. That community that we once took so selfishly from, we owe a debt. Guys would look on us like we had sold out. There's good in everybody. I see it. But we never sold out. This is true rehabilitation. We just grew up. The 50, directed and produced by Brenton Geeser, showcases the nation's first incarcerated substance abuse counselor program. It's the story of the first 50 participants in one of the most powerful models of rehabilitation, helping men serving life sentences turn into certified addiction counselors. And we are joined now in studio by director Brenton Geeser and Cameron Clark, a member of the 50. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for, uh, for joining us. April is Second Chance Month and, and really echoes some of the themes uh, that we see in the 50 of, of trauma, of, of rehabilitation, of, of repair. Mm -hmm. uh, give us a sense of why you decided, Brenton, a decade after the program's inception, uh, to release the documentary now. Yeah, so the story for me, what struck me most about the stories of the men and just the stories of the 50, the program itself, was that this is a, it's a story of healing. It's a story of this journey, this radical journey of healing and the courage it takes in order to heal and what could come out on the other side of this. It's a mirror that can be held up to anybody who watches this film. So really, it's a universal story that I hope everybody connects with. The documentary is called The 50, but it focuses on the first three people, right? Three of yes. them, and you're, you're one of them. And, and we just heard Brenton talk about healing. I, I'm curious how the program has helped you to heal. The program has helped me heal in so many ways. It's given me an opportunity to really look at my life. You know, um, as a young person, and how I got to the point to where I became incarcerated in the first place. There was a whole lot of trauma that I had just pent up within me that I never really had a chance to express. Um, I never had a chance to address as far as uh, my upbringings are concerned. And, you know, it really gave me an opportunity to lay everything on the table in a non-biased uh, atmosphere. So the 50 gave me a safe place to bring my issues mm. and to heal. Um, and it's a, it, the program is just a beautiful program. And, and Brenton, you've talked about how uh, many of the, the participants are mm. victims as well as victimizers. Yeah, exactly. How were you able to really kind of focus on the duality of that yeah. in the documentary? It's a challenge. It's a challenge. I think all of us, maybe to lesser degrees, can relate to that. We've all experienced traumas. We've all caused hurt and pain in our lives, you know, and we've seen the ripple effects of that happen. I think because of that, and having been one of those people who've experienced both sides of that in my own life, um, I knew I wanted to make sure to understand the story of the victims. Cameron, talk to us about how prevalent a problem drugs plays. How much does that really plague the insides of of many of our, our prisons and jails throughout the country. Yeah, well, we have to understand one thing about um, individuals being able to cope with their situations. I know that a lot of young men out there on the streets are going through it. Socioeconomics isn't really good. Um, we have to create ways in order to uh, take care of ourselves. And this is as a result of what's, what may be taking place in a household, absent mother or uh, a father that might be on drugs, um, a community where older men might somewhat take advantage of the young people. Um, I know for myself, uh, drinking alcohol was a supplement for me, right? So not having that family structure there, I created a family of my own. And using drugs and alcohol as a coping mechanism for some people 
to just get by. And for a lot of kids, it's, it, it, it's, it's that way as well. And so we find ourselves in situations where we get caught up and we become incarcerated as a result of not being able to manage um, what we had going on as youth. Brenton, Cameron, we thank you both so much for your time. Really appreciate the work that you're doing. Want to let our viewers know you can stream The 50 right now on Apple TV and Prime Video. As we celebrate Earth Day, we go behind the scenes and meet some of the volunteers helping to clean up our planet. 10 million miles of American shoreline, a precious and endangered resource. Waterways in the U.S. are littered with billions of pieces of litter. Thanks to these Loyola University student volunteers, this Great Lakes shore is getting a pick-me-up this weekend. A lot of cigarette butts. Beer bottles, um, some plastic, a lot of plastic. Enter the Alliance for the Great Lakes, a 30-year-old organization that trains and organizes volunteers to help clean up that litter with their Adopt-A-Beach program. The Alliance hosts 9,000 volunteers who fan out to do 900 cleanups a year along the Great Lakes, banding together to pick up the litter and record the data. This is the kind of data that no individual scientist could get, but because this is hundreds of thousands of volunteers, we have a lot of information to learn from. One thing they've learned is the prevalence of plastics. 86% of the pieces of litter removed by volunteers are composed either partially or fully of plastics. Unlike America's roadways, our shores are not regularly cleared of litter. They're also harder to access, so their cleanup relies on volunteers like these students. Last year, Great Lakes volunteers collected more than 500,000 pieces of litter, and the group expects to collect at least as much again this year. Well, I think being in these cleanups and around these volunteers definitely gives me a sense of hope. Being around that energy gives me hope that there is hope for solutions to this issue. We could certainly use those solutions and always appreciate the hope. That is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, the first witness takes the stand in the criminal trial of Donald Trump and a massive fire breaks out at a landfill. What officials are using to try to extinguish it? Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. So these bags are identical, but one is real and one is fake. This feels like real. So I got a bunch of super fakes. Some of these are chef's kiss. I'll be a dollar line. This is a counterfeit. Really? The Louis Vuitton, the Prada, the Gucci, we get everything. To make us a, a super fake is easier now than ever before. Anybody can be fooled, anybody. Super fakes, now streaming on Hulu. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. This is our combat operations center. We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Hi. 
Where are you? Where are you? Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The cut fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. You have not told us the complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. <laughs> You're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including Donald Trump's hush money trial kicking off in a major way, what we heard from Trump's legal team and prosecutors, and the testimony from former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker, and who else is expected to testify in a case that could rock the political world. Plus, the foreign aid package making its way through Congress that could be signed by the president any day now, but could it ban TikTok along with it? The near disaster at one of the busiest airports in the country. Authorities say air traffic control cleared four planes to cross in front of a passenger jet. It was just about to take off. The pilot then aborting takeoff. We have the calls to the tower. And an Olympic finalist is banned. We'll tell you why and from where. But we do begin with opening statements in the first testimony in Donald Trump's historic criminal trial here in New York. For the first time, a former American president is on trial for criminal charges, facing 34 counts of falsifying business records to allegedly cover up a hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels just before the 2016 election. Donald Trump sat stone-faced as prosecutors accused the former president of a criminal conspiracy and a cover-up to influence the election. The defense pushed back, saying there is nothing wrong with trying to influence an election, saying none of what is accused was a crime. Then prosecutors called their first witness, David Pecker, the former publisher of the National Enquirer, calling him an alleged co-conspirator in the plot to silence Stormy Daniels and others. ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky leads us off. Donald Trump walking into the Manhattan courtroom where today, for the first time in history, a jury heard testimony in a criminal case against a former American president. It's a very, very sad day in America, I can tell you that. With Trump slouching in his seat and sometimes closing his eyes, prosecutor Matthew Colangelo began his opening statement charging Trump orchestrated a criminal scheme to corrupt the 2016 presidential election. Jurors listening intently, some taking notes as the prosecutor laid out his case, accusing Trump of falsifying business records to disguise a $130,000 hush payment to porn star Stormy Daniels days before the election so voters wouldn't find out about her claim of an affair. At the time, Trump was under pressure. News had just broken of the Access Hollywood tape. Trump caught on camera bragging about groping women. The prosecutor today quoting Trump's own words to the jury. When you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. You can do anything, the prosecutor slowly reciting to the jury. Prosecutors said the tape's impact was explosive, and Trump and his campaign were deeply concerned. So when Trump learned Stormy Daniels was shopping a story of their alleged liaison, prosecutors said he was adamant it not come out, fearing it could have been devastating to the campaign. Prosecutors allege at Trump's direction, his fixer, Michael Cohen, paid Daniels off and agreed to cook the books. So when Trump reimbursed him, it appeared as routine legal bills. The prosecutor called it a conspiracy to influence the 2016 election to help Donald Trump get elected. Election fraud, pure and simple. In his opening statement, defense attorney Todd Blanche insisting President Trump is innocent. President Trump did not commit any crimes. I have a spoiler alert, he told the jury. There is nothing wrong with trying to influence an election. It's called democracy. There is nothing illegal about entering into a non-disclosure agreement, he continued, period. He said Trump was unaware of any effort to camouflage the payment to Daniels as a business expense, and he told the jury Michael Cohen, a key prosecution witness, has an obsession with getting Trump. He cannot be trusted. But prosecutors insist the alleged criminal conspiracy to protect Trump involved others, including their first witness, David Pecker, the former National Enquirer publisher who once called Trump a personal friend. As Pecker took the stand, Trump leaned forward, arms crossed, an angry look on his face. 
Pecker has acknowledged buying negative stories about the candidate only to bury them, a practice known as catch and kill. On the stand, Pecker was blunt. We used checkbook journalism. We paid for stories. He's testifying under a subpoena, having cut a deal with prosecutors to avoid charges himself. He was only on the stand a few minutes today, but he'll be back tomorrow. Leaving court, Trump, who denies the affair with Daniels, tried to downplay the case against him. It's a case as to bookkeeping, which is a very minor thing in terms of the law. Aaron Katursky joins us now from outside of the courthouse. Aaron, what's up for tomorrow? So David Pecker will be back on the witness stand tomorrow, Lindsay. But before that, the judge is going to hear arguments over whether Trump violated his gag order. Prosecutors say it's happened repeatedly when Trump has posted disparaging things about witnesses, including Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels. Prosecutors want Trump to pay a fine, $1,000 per each offending post. But they also want the judge to hold Trump in contempt. And that could lead to even more severe consequences. Lindsay? All right, just a snowball effect potentially. Aaron Katursky, we know we've seen a lot of you as this trial continues. Thank you. For more on today's proceedings in the courtroom and what to watch for as the trial gets underway, we're joined now by Kim Whaley. She's an ABC News legal analyst and author of the forthcoming book, Pardon Power. Kim, thank you so much for joining us. What stood out to you in the opening statements from the prosecution and defense today? Well, it's the prosecution laid out that it's this is not just about whether the jury's going to believe Michael Cohen, but they said they have corroborating evidence that's going to back up his story, presumably that he talked to Donald Trump and Donald Trump knew and had the intention to do this hush money payment to basically benefit the election. On the defense side, um, the seems like the argument wasn't so much, listen, this didn't happen, or even that he, Donald Trump wasn't aware of it. I think they will argue argue that and that, you know, of course, Michael Cohen's not to be trusted, all that. But they're essentially encouraging the jury to nullify the charges and to have a sort of a shrug about this, kind of uh, making the argument that even if everything the prosecution says is true, it doesn't matter because this is just the hurly burly rough and tumble of a presidential election to do these kinds of things. And the prosecution in this case must prove that Trump not only falsified business records, but that he did so in order to commit some other crime. Do you think that that's a high bar here? You know, I do in part um, because the falsification of business records in New York tends to be tacked on to other kinds of crimes, so that's novel. But also the theory that um, these hush money payments constituted violations of the federal campaign and election laws, I think there's some debate on that. And, the, and again, the prosecution's going to need, in order to raise this from a misdemeanor to a felony, that's where we are, to have to demonstrate the intent was to, to impact the election. The the timeline itself, though, Lindsay, you know, the, the, after the Access Hollywood tape, the allegations that maybe even the RNC was going to drop him as a candidate, uh, there's a strong sort of argument that this was for that purpose, which I believe is why the defense came up and said, well, even if this happens, listen, you know, jury, this just it doesn't rise to the level of a crime that could deprive this man of his liberty uh, and put him in prison, which essentially are the implications here, even though it seems like a lesser type of case than the other three that are pending against him in other courtrooms across the country. And less than a minute to go here, but the prosecution's first witness is former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker. He'll be on the stand tomorrow again. Uh, what will you be watching for from him? Well, it all boils down, really, that the line between civil liability and criminal liability is this intent, this mens rea. So will, will David Pecker testify? Reportedly, there was a high-level meeting with him and Michael Cohen. Is he going to give testimony about what he discussed with Donald Trump, not just with respect to Stormy Daniels, but with respect to Karen McDougal, some others around, listen, we have to put a lid on this because of the election. It's that because and whether David Pecker can tie Donald Trump Trump's knowledge and intent to the story that matters. ABC News legal analyst Kim Whaley, we thank you so much as always. Tensions continue to be high at Columbia University, causing classes to go remote today. This all due to the continuing debate surrounding Israel and Palestinians. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has the latest. Tonight, college campuses scrambling to handle a growing pro-Palestinian protest movement. Columbia University stepping up campus security and moving classes online. The school's president saying we need a reset to de-escalate the rancor. NYPD, KKK. 
But today, fresh arrests and tensions boiling over on the first night of Passover. This Israeli assistant professor confronting university officials over being denied access to the main lawn as school officials try to separate protesters. I am a professor here. I have every right to be everywhere on campus. You cannot let people that support Hamas on campus and me, a professor, not go on campus. Let me in now. It comes after a campus rabbi urged students to stay home, saying the school and the NYPD cannot guarantee Jewish students' safety. New York Mayor Eric Adams saying he is horrified and disgusted with anti-Semitism spewed at and around Columbia's campus. Pointing to videos circulating online, such as this one, showing a woman in front of pro-Israel protesters with a sign reading Al-Khazam's next targets, a reference to Hamas's military wing. Made me sick hearing the things they were saying and doing. Um, so over this holiday, I kind of just want to try to avoid it as best as I can for my own safety. Many pro-Palestinian protesters insist their movement is peaceful. Violence has no place on, on this movement, uh, and we regret some of, some of the uh, incidents that has happened uh, that were actually unassociated with, with this movement. The protests, calling for colleges to divest from companies with ties to Israel, now spreading to other campuses. Today, at least 45 people arrested at Yale University. At NYU, a standoff with police after protesters were told to vacate a campus plaza. Many student protests in solidarity with those Columbia protesters. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, when will students be able to return to campus at Columbia? Well, many students here are still waiting to find out. They are not sure when they can return to in-person classes. We do know that the New York governor, Kathy Hochul, did visit the campus today, calling for people to find humanity and have those difficult conversations so they can understand different points of view. Lindsay. Conversation so important. Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. Now to the near disaster at JFK Airport. After authorities say air traffic control cleared four planes to cross in front of a passenger jet as it was about to take off. Here's ABC's Ike Jaji. Tonight, the FAA is investigating a near disaster at one of the nation's busiest airports. An April 17th Zurich-bound Swiss air flight cleared for takeoff at JFK, beginning to speed down the runway, forced to abort after noticing air traffic control also cleared four other planes to cross that same runway, putting them on a collision course. Listen to air traffic control clearing Swiss air flight 17. Swiss 117, you four left, there, stay off. Then, moments later, as the plane is headed down the runway, the pilot suddenly sees the other planes taxiing and aborts the takeoff. Tonight, the Swiss airline praising their quick-thinking team, saying in a statement due to the high level of situational awareness, a potentially dangerous situation was quickly de-escalated. Moving four aircraft across an active runway uh, and one controller not talking to another indicates a special level of stress. The incident came just a day before another near catastrophic close call. Panic in the tower at Washington's Reagan National Airport as two packed planes came within 400 feet of each other. A JetBlue flight cleared for takeoff, forced to slam on its brakes after air traffic control noticed they cleared a southwest plane to taxi across the same runway. A number of these close calls lately, Ike Jachi joins us. Now, Ike, what does the FAA plan to do when it comes to air traffic controllers? Well, Lindsay, while the FAA investigates this latest incident, they're also addressing fatigue concerns for all air traffic controllers, increasing the amount of rest time between shifts. Lindsay? All right, Ike Ajachi for us. Thanks so much, Ike. For the first time in decades, the Supreme Court heard a major case involving homelessness. The justices heard arguments for more than two and a half hours and appear to favor cities having the ability to find unhoused people for sleeping outside. Critics, though, say this amounts to cruel and unusual punishment. It comes as homeless numbers are skyrocketing nationwide. Ukrainian President Zelensky is expressing relief and gratitude after the House approved a massive aid package with bipartisan support. The Senate is expected to take it up tomorrow. ABC's Selena Wang is on Capitol Hill tonight. Tonight, with that $95 billion aid package finally making its way through Congress, a new lifeline for Ukraine in its war against Russia. President Zelensky saying in his evening address, I am grateful to Mr. President, his team, everyone in the United States Congress, personally to Speaker Johnson, and all who support the active defense of freedom. 
Zelensky speaking to President Biden by phone today, Biden vowing to sign the bill into law as soon as it reaches his desk. But tonight, Russia's foreign minister warning the Westerners are teetering dangerously on the brink of a direct military clash between nuclear powers. The bill is passed. It comes just days after Speaker Mike Johnson put his job on the line to pass that aid package in the House. Nearly $61 billion for Ukraine, $26 billion for Israel, and $8 billion for Taiwan. Plus, legislation that would ban TikTok if its Chinese parent company doesn't sell the app. You do the right thing and you let the chips fall where they may. It's a dramatic 180 for Johnson, a devout Christian who was staunchly against aid to Ukraine. But after classified briefings and lots of praying, Johnson making a complete turnaround, arguing that Ukraine is critical to U.S. national security. But hardline Republicans fuming with at least three still threatening to oust him. He's uh, disappointed us. He can't be speaker. So I'm drawing a line in the sand here. Selena joins us now. Uh, Selena, what's next for the aid package? And secondly, can you tell us a little more about that possible TikTok ban? Yeah, Lindsay, so this $95 billion aid package, it is expected to speed through the Senate. And there is bipartisan support, Lindsay, for that potential TikTok ban in there. But this could be a very long road ahead. First of all, it's very hard to find a buyer that can afford TikTok. So experts tell me it is likely that it could go public instead. In addition to that, TikTok, they would fight any potential ban in the courts, and the Chinese government could block a possible sale. Lindsay? Selena Wang from Capitol Hill for us. Thanks so much, Selena. A scare for Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass. Police arrested a suspect for allegedly breaking into her home early Sunday morning while she was inside. ABC's Trevor Alt has the details. Tonight, Los Angeles investigators working to determine whether the alleged break-in at the home of Mayor Karen Bass was a targeted attack. Units responding to incident 1065. The alarm was personally activated. The LAPD saying early Sunday morning the suspect smashed through a glass door. The mayor's office telling ABC the mayor and other family members were inside when it happened. The LA Times reporting she hid in a safe room as the suspect made it to the second floor. The advisors, uh subject inside the residence right now. Officers on the scene within minutes, arresting 29-year-old Ephraim Matthew Hunter, booking him on a felony burglary charge. We have one in custody. They're clearing the house right now. Court records show Hunter was previously charged with kidnapping and attempted murder back in 2015 in Massachusetts. He was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon, sentenced to five to seven years in prison. The mayor today declining to reveal details of this new investigation. Let me just say, uh, first of all, I am fine. My family is fine. And uh, we are going to do everything we can to keep Angelino safe. Our thanks to Trevor for that. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, we speak with animal conservationist and model Freya Aspinall. But next, an Olympic finalist is banned. We tell you why and where from. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. You guys don't know what happened that day. The day that my son died. The clock fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. You have not told us the complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. Just, you're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC.
from the team that brought you the DuPont Award-winning report, a groundbreaking new investigation spanning 9,000 miles, trashed the secret life of plastic exports, streaming Tuesday night on ABC News Live. With so much at stake in our world right now, more Americans turn here to David than anywhere else. And now, America's most trusted, most watched newscast, ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir, is available to you on YouTube. Reporting from the Iowa caucuses, I'm Whit Johnson. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Residents in New Delhi complained of breathing problems after a massive fire broke out in a landfill. Large plumes of smoke continue to rise from the burning landfill in the city's eastern district, where excavators were seen removing piles of garbage to de-escalate the fire. Hundreds marched through a northern city in Niger this past weekend to demand the departure of U.S. troops from the military base there. There were a little more than 1,000 U.S. troops in Niger as of last year, where the U.S. military operated out of two bases. Last year, Niger's army seized power in a coup. Prior to that, Niger had been a key security partner of the United States and France. A runner from Ethiopia who reached the 3,000-meter steeplechase final at the Tokyo Olympics and narrowly missed the World Championship podium last year has been banned for five years after testing positive for two banned substances. The athlete admitted to breaking anti-doping rules after samples she gave flagged up traces of testosterone and another substance, EPO, which can help athletes' blood transport more oxygen. Her videos of cuddling lion cubs and bonding with gorillas have taken the internet by storm. Freya Aspinall has showcased her love of animals since birth and now hopes to continue her family's mission of protecting endangered animals and returning them back to the wild. Freya, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us about your family's foundation and the meaning, the purpose, they call it rewilding. Explain what that aim is. Yeah, so our foundation, we send animals back to the wild where they belong. And we've rewilded nearly 2,000 animals. We've rewilded 80 gorillas. We're the only people in the world that has ever sent a gorilla back to the wild. We're the first rewild cheetah, soon to be elephants. We've rewilded nearly 400 primates. And rewilding basically just means, in this case, sending animals back to the wild. Emotionally, what kind of toll does that take on you? And, and I'm wondering if there's any way to know on the animals, especially once you get so close to the animal, to the human, and then you send them off on their way? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, selfishly, of course, these, you know, these animals are like members of my family. Of course, I want to be seeing them all the time, but I know they're much happier. I mean, I, and you can definitely see the difference. So sometimes, you know, I, I hate ourselves that we've put them behind bars in captivity, and I know this is where they belong. So it is a little bit sad, but it's so much more rewarding visiting them in the wild where they should be. And when you were a baby, your dad uh, placed you in a, a, an enclosure, a gorilla enclosure on his land. And, and I'm curious if during that time, during those formative years, you knew you instantly had this bond, this love for animals. Yeah, both me and my sisters, Tansy and Clary, were all, you know, we were basically introduced to the gorillas from like a few weeks old. And so it's been incredibly normal to us to, you know, have these relationships. And as I said, they're like members of our family. A, a video of you uh, a few weeks ago went viral, basically, when you were taking care of, of two lion cubs after uh, their mother passed away. Uh, give us a sense if you have any update on, on how they're doing now. Yeah, so Zemo and Zala, their mother di died three days after giving birth, and they're about to be sent back to Africa. So I had to hand raise them. That's why you see videos of me with them, because they had no mother and they were going to die. So luckily now they're about 11 months old. We're now planning for them to be returned back to Africa. So they died at our, sorry, their mother died at our sanctuary, but they're going to be living the rest of their lives in Africa. What's your biggest concern about animals in the wild on this planet? I don't have a concern about animals being in the wild. I have a concern about animals being in captivity mm. because, as I said, we're the only people in the world that are sending these animals back to the wild. I mean, it's crazy. And, you know, we've just launched the foundation in the USA, so hopefully this will help bring more awareness to, st to bring more awareness about sending animals back to the wild. But um, it's more concerning that more people aren't doing this. How can people contribute to the foundation? 
Um, well, we've just partnered with Angel Link, which is a crowdfunding platform where people can donate, and it's under Angels for Animals. And, you know, we have the Aspinall Foundation website where you can donate. And, again, we've just launched the foundation. So, you know, everything obviously can help make a difference. But I always say from a little slight change of the mindset can go a really long way. So just acknowledging that zoos aren't sending animals back to the wild and animals are so much happier there can go a long way. What would you say to people who say, well, zoo, it's not that hard of a life. They don't have to even hunt for their food. It's given to them. They have, uh, you know, all, all the basic creature comforts of life. Why would you uh, tell someone that, that the zoo is not the best place? I love that question. And I get, I do get asked that. Well, it's, it's very simple. How would you like it? We all hated lockdown. You know, we, we thought it was outrageous. And these animals are in permanent lockdown. They are in prison. We have imprisoned them. We've taken away all their freedom. And quite simply, put yourself in their shoes. Imagine being stuck in the room. Anyone that's watching this, the room you're in right now, imagine never leaving that room. It's inhumane. And I always say, as humans, we have a duty to be the voice for those that don't have a voice and to fight for those that can't fight. And we've, these animals don't have a voice. Freya Aspinall, we thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you joining us. To learn more about the Aspinall Foundation, you can visit their website at aspinallfoundation.org. And still to come, meet the student volunteers coming together to pick up litter and improve our water on this Earth Day. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. So these bags are identical, but one is real and one is fake. This feels like real. So I got a bunch of super fakes. Some of these are chef's kiss. Mm -hmm. This is a counterfeit. Really? The Louis Vuitton, the Prada, the Gucci, we get everything. To make us a super fake is easier now than ever before. Anybody can be fooled. Anybody. Super fakes, now streaming on Hulu. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The clock fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. You have not told us the complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. You're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The Interrogation Tapes, a new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. As we celebrate Earth Day, we go behind the scenes and meet some of the volunteers helping to clean up our planet. 10 million miles of American shoreline, a precious and endangered resource. Waterways in the U.S. are littered with billions of pieces of litter. Thanks to these Loyola University student volunteers, this Great Lakes shore is getting a pick-me-up this weekend. A lot of cigarette butts. Beer bottles, um, some plastic, a lot, a lot of plastic. Napkins. Enter the Alliance for the Great Lakes, a 30-year-old organization that trains and organizes volunteers to help clean up that litter with their Adopt-A-Beach program. The Alliance hosts 9,000 volunteers who fan out to do 900 cleanups a year along the Great Lakes, banding together to pick up the litter and record the data. This is the kind of data that no individual scientist could get, but because this is hundreds of thousands of volunteers, we have a lot of information to learn from. One thing they've learned is the prevalence of plastics. 86% of the pieces of 
litter removed by volunteers are composed either partially or fully of plastics. Unlike America's roadways, our shores are not regularly cleared of litter. They're also harder to access, so their cleanup relies on volunteers like these students. Last year, Great Lakes volunteers collected more than 500,000 pieces of litter, and the group expects to collect at least as much again this year. Well, I think being in these cleanups and around these volunteers definitely gives me a sense of hope. Being around that energy gives me hope that there is hope for solutions to this issue. We could certainly use those solutions and always appreciate the hope. That is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. parents who just let their kid watch violent movies or play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored